Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us uh, for this. I, I do think you'll find this very uh, useful and informative and, and hopefully very interesting and lively. Uh, we have a great panel I'm going to come to in a minute. As Paul said, I'm Don Baer. Uh, you might ask, you know, what am I doing up here with a big worldwide survey and a conversation about millennials and old guy like me? So uh, first off, uh, I am the father of two millennial sons, so I've had to understand a little bit about what that's all about. And one of the things we were talking about earlier, they're four years apart, I think you will see. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's divergence even, you know, um, within this cohort. Uh, so it's a very interesting and dynamic uh, generation of people. Um, but, you know, for the work that we are all in, uh, I would say it's critically important that we all understand the millennial generation for at least two reasons. First off, they are the lifeblood of our industry, of our sector. Uh, we all need to be hiring more of them. We need to be sort of integrating them into what we're doing. They clearly are driving so much of the digital social revolution that we're all living through. Um, uh, so it's, it's very important from an almost internal communication standpoint, that we understand uh, what drives and motivates them and, and take advantage of that. But secondly, and of course obviously, uh, they are the emerging cohort and generation. They are uh, coming into their own. Uh, the group that we surveyed is between the ages of 18 and 30. Uh, so imagine uh, how they are driving consumption habits, how they are driving uh, perception of the world, of all different aspects of uh, of what's going on in the world. So it's a, it's a very important group. Quickly, before I go to the introductions here, what we're gonna present here today uh, are the results from a survey that was done in January and February of this year. Uh, I love Paul's use of the word massive. Uh, it is, as best we can tell, the largest global survey of the millennial generation ever conducted. 12,000 respondents uh, on every continent in the world, 27 countries. Uh, uh, a very long survey, I think it was about 180 questions, so you can imagine how rich the material is, and we're just going to be able to touch on some of the highlights today. Uh, and we have a wonderful panel uh, to help us talk about and comment on uh, what, what is in that survey. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves first, and then uh, I'm going to come back and go through it. And I want to say first, before we go to the introductions, as Paul indicated, our partner in all of this our client has been Telefonica. Richard Poston is here from London. Um, uh, uh, Telefonica has been a tremendous partner as we've done all this, and we've had a great, great launch set of activities in the last almost six months now, starting with uh, the Royal Opera House on June the 4th in London, uh, where we had uh, uh, tremendous guests and, and great interest, but has really spread around the world at this point, and Richard will talk some about that in a minute. So uh, we, we hope that this is research that's just not sitting there. We're actually making an impact with it, uh, and it's beginning to help shape how uh, people in governments and businesses and uh, the NGO sector are beginning to think about the millennial generation. So with that, let me turn to the uh, panel, let them quickly introduce themselves, and then we'll come back and walk you through some of the results. Richard. Uh, thanks, Don. Uh, hi, my name's Richard Poston. Uh, I look after corporate affairs and communications for Telefonica in Europe. Um, Telefonica, as you will know, uh, an international telco. Uh, we provide uh, uh, fixed mobile broadband and IPTV services to 320 million uh, clients uh, globally. Uh, in Europe, uh, that's just over 100 million um, that we look after. Uh, and obviously, the bulk of our, our clients are from Latin America, where the other 220 million come from. Um, I think, uh, as Don says, and he's done the intro from a millennial survey point of view, uh, it's critical uh, of our base, uh, a customer base, 90 million of our customers are 18 to 30 year olds, so they are the adult uh, millennials, if you like, uh, and of our employee base, 30,000 are uh, millennials. So understanding um, what inspires them, their hopes and fears, and, and, and how they see the future is critical for us from a business sustainability point of view. Hi, I'm Silvina Moschini, as many of the women here, I'm a multitasker, I'm a digital entrepreneur, co-founder of Transparent Business, a company that aims at making outsourcing transparently, also a founder of Wiki Experts and Intuic, I'm also a contributing expert for CNN Español on digital trends and technology. Hi, my name is Fernando Vila, I'm the... Uh VP of Programming for Fusion, which is a uh, joint venture between ABC News and Univision. Uh, it's a digital and cable network for 
uh, young people in this country, sort of aiming at the young and diverse multicultural America. Uh, that's my day job. I also moonlight as the host of a weekly soccer show for Fusion, uh, Sunday nights at 10. Um, and how the hell I got that, I still don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Danny LaFuente. I'm one of the co-founders, the COO and CFO of The Lab Miami. Lab Miami is a co-working space. It's a shared office. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as uh, an idea incubator. So we provide the space, provide the learning opportunities, access to mentorship and capital um, that millennials and, and entrepreneurs of all ages and all backgrounds can sort of take their ideas uh, from that idea phase uh, to fruition. Great. Thank you. So. As I said, many implications and some impact out of this survey. One that I want to touch on quickly. As a result of this, I launched inside Burson Marsteller a new reverse mentoring program. Uh, and so trying to lead the way on this, I have my own reverse mentor now. It's a fellow named uh, Patrick Curley who helps to run our digital and social activity. He and I have had some meetings. Uh, and the one thing I learned, among other things, out of that meeting was how to do a selfie. So there's a selfie of Patrick and me sort of out in the marketplace. And, but there's much more than, than selfies only there to hear. So again, as we said, this is the largest and most comprehensive survey ever done. Uh, just to show you the map of where we were around the world, uh, it was done as an internet survey, but where we needed, where there was not great internet connectivity in some countries, we brought people in so that we could do uh, a one-on-one -on -one survey uh, with them. Um, here we go. All right, big key filings. So first, uh, it, I actually, I think the, the uh, stereotype of the millennial generation as being very self-oriented, self-focused, selfish, actually is, is disproved in this survey. Uh, yes, they are focused on their own concerns and considerations, but uh, what comes through loud and clear is their strong connection to, te to technology. Uh, and their concern about whether or not technology's benefits are being shared equally around the world and up and down throughout their, their cohort, but also among many other people. Um, so the role of technology, as you might imagine, is critically important to this generation. What makes them tick? Uh, again, a group that's very concerned uh, about the economy, uh, but not just in broad terms. They're very concerned for their own sake. They're very concerned about what kind of careers they might have. They're very concerned whether or not, in fact, it comes through, they will ever be able to retire. There's a huge spike when you ask them, would you ever be able to retire based on what you can save during your lifetime? They have no conception of that. And if you think about this generation, uh, since 2008, when we've been living through uh, worldwide economics uh, circumstances that have been at best sluggish and at worst crisis, uh, they are growing up in that world. And so this is something that could have long-term implications. Uh, opportunity, however, is something, again, they're young, they're optimistic, uh, and where they look forward, and it's one of the reasons why we have some people on the panel here to talk about this, the sense of entrepreneurship, the sense that they actually can make a difference, uh, that they can... Uh, both in terms of social and economic needs where they live, but also in terms of being able to create value in businesses, they actually feel pretty empowered about that. And it, you'll see there's some skews depending on where they live. And finally, and very interestingly, uh, when we, we, we looked at the data and cut it in many different ways, there is a group, it's about 11% worldwide, that we think of as the millennial leaders. They are people who are very comfortable with technology, they're very comfortable with the pace of change around the world. Uh, they believe that they can make a real difference in their communities and in the places that they're living. Uh, and they, they are very ambitious for the future and to succeed. And so there is a group that I think as we watch over the next several years that are these millennial leaders, and of course because they're leaders, they're also for purposes of what we all do, going to be perhaps leading in terms of how people consume, how people sort of embrace certain ideas. In fact, they will be the ones creating the ideas that people are, 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 are embracing. So then to go into this, uh, some, some data points that I think you'll find interesting. They are deeply, deeply connected, right? They're the smartphone generation. 76% of them around the world say they have smartphones. And you can see you know, how that breaks down region to region here. Um, and indeed, I think it's surprising to some people that uh, some of the marketplaces that uh, we're all in, uh, smartphone technology has already begun to penetrate. That, as we know, is only going to grow uh, very quickly. But that changes their relationship to information and how they actually go about embracing and understanding the world around them very much. Um, they're always connected. 
Uh, there's been a lot of studies about how much television time, how much reading time, how much internet time. Uh, it's hard to imagine how much more time people can pile on top of their media consumption, but the, the, the consumption of the internet and being online and what they're doing is growing very, very quickly. Uh, and you know, it's interesting that you can see it pretty evenly spread around the world in different marketplaces. A lot of implications for governments, for consumer brands, uh, for all kinds of business interests uh, related to all of this, of course. Uh, this one, I think, should be a bit of a shocker. Uh, anyone who works for uh, television businesses, uh, and certainly those of us who work with and for print organizations, uh, this confirms what many of them are worried about. But look, look at the SKUs here. This is where they receive their information and entertainment. So uh, when there's, they're looking for credible coverage of news, barely a third of them is going to television anymore. Uh, they're going to the internet. And for the entertainment piece, which of course the definition of entertainment is changing dramatically, as we know, but even with new programs and services that are coming forward even this week with Amazon uh, bringing out uh, scripted programming and certainly Netflix and the like, uh, that change of mix is going to be making, creating dramatic shifts uh, over the course of the next several years. Uh, they do believe, as I suggested, that technology creates a lot of opportunity. They see it as a positive force, by and large. Uh, we did a lot of great verbatims where we got information back from them uh, that, that it makes so many things, so many connections easier. Uh, but they are worried about this point of equalization. They, and there's a lot of concern in here about whether or not everyone is sharing in the benefits of technology. And again, this is coming from those who have the benefit of the technology and don't have the benefit of the technology, even though most of them were responding to us uh, on the internet. Um, this is one of the most interesting findings of all to me, the gender gap. Uh, and we're gonna talk some about this. Uh, you see a definite difference between the way men and women respond to the idea and the role of technology in their lives, whether or not they are masters of technology or not, uh, how they take to certain of the subject matters, uh, their engagement in social and digital media. Randy Zuckerberg, of course, has talked about this and talked yesterday to the group about it, but here's the statistical evidence. And when you look at this first question, do they consider themselves on the cutting edge of technology? Uh, and the fact that, you know, fully more than 10% more men than women around the world feel that way. When they talk about whether or not uh, it's influential in shaping their outlook on life. Now, you can interpret that many ways, that's okay, but that's a very big difference. Um, and so, it does raise questions for public policy, it also raises questions for, you know, communications and media and the work that we're in. Um, this is economically, as I suggested, there's some concerns. Uh, you, you certainly see here lower numbers in terms of whether or not their countries, their regions, their economies are on the right track, lower numbers than you would like to see uh, from young people who typically are very optimistic about the future, but look at the numbers in Asia. Uh, and for that matter, look at the numbers in the Middle East and Africa, which are still not high enough but are actually cresting higher than some of the more developed regions of the world. And so when you look at Western Europe and you think about what that means, and Richard thinks about this, uh, in terms of people's lack of optimism about their economic circumstances, that can have real impact. Um, uh, this is the point, and this is very personal to them. Uh, this is probably a very well-educated generation. We know it's a very well-connected generation in terms of technology, all of those things, but they are deeply, deeply worried about whether or not they're gonna have a career, what it's gonna turn into, and this is, you know, there's a way to sort of measure intensity here. These are very intense feelings that they have, and so that suggests how much they are gonna stick with businesses that invest in them, but also how much they believe they'll have the opportunity to be invested in, and so it changes the mindset as they go. Um, but there is opportunity, this point about entrepreneurship, you see that they believe they have opportunities in the countries that they're in, uh, to basically create futures, not just for themselves, but for the people who will be touched by those businesses. And, and those are strong numbers. So that, those are the findings at the top line. There's much, much more here. You're going to be able to sort of access this online, and I encourage you to do it. I want to turn to the questions now so we have time to talk to everyone and also give you some opportunity to have the conversation. I'm going to go to Richard first. And Richard, 
why was this important for Telefonica? Why would Telefonica care about the millennial generation and, and want to uh, in, engage in this study? Uh, thanks, Don. Um, uh, hopefully, from what's just been presented, it, it, it's a, a fairly obvious leap to understand that if you're uh, a telecommunications company responsible for rolling out networks, um, giving connectedness or connectivity to um, uh, the global population, um, and investing hugely in, in networks, 4G, 3G, uh, fiber, etc., then, then you know, it, clearly you can see that the, the, the results are important uh, for us to understand. I think, and Paul said it uh, in the introduction, I mean, the summit has looked at uh, future uh, and what's happening. Without a shadow of a doubt, we are living through um, a, a digital revolution, um, digital and social revolution, which I think arguably will have a, a larger impact than the Industrial Revolution did um, of decades ago. Uh, we all know that it is fundamentally changing how consumers consume, and communicate. It's fundamentally changing business models and, uh, and how businesses uh, operate today. Um, it's breaking down the barriers for new global businesses to be set up using the internet. You, you saw on, the, on, on what Don presented, uh, the ubiquitous use of smartphones, tablets, that connectivity. Um, that enables people to set up businesses um, that a decade ago would have been unthinkable or would have cost 30 million euros or dollars or whatever to set up a business so people can set up global businesses and indeed and we can see it and it's happening all the time it is challenging traditional companies um, uh, in their own business models and if they don't move fast enough if they don't um, really understand what is happening uh, then then frankly they will go out of business so from our point of view there's a huge amount of change going on in in telecommunications business models are changing um, what we need to understand is we need to understand what inspires, what motivates, and what drives um, that change, and that, you know, understanding, therefore, the future business leaders, homeowners, who are today the millennial generation, is, is critically important for our business sustainability. Equally, we want to attract the best talent into Telefonica, um, but not just attract it so you know, they come in, use it on their CV and move off after a year or two, um, but actually really to, to, to fuel the change that's needed in the industry. And if you're going to attract those people, you need to be attractive to them. You need to understand what it is that does attract them, um, how you empower them, how you motivate them. Because there's a virtuous circle in, in any of our businesses, um, and, and it's linked to your employees, to your customers, to your shareholders and society. If your employees are happy, motivated, great satisfac satisfaction, then your customers will get that. If your customers are, then you'll get the business returns. Your shareholders will be happy, and if you're making money, you can then benefit society as well. So it's a virtual circle. The only other thing I'd say is, from our point of view, it wasn't a question, as, as Don has said, of, of doing this survey, announcing it, job done. Um, we've tried to make, I mean, all of the information is public. Uh, we've put the raw data onto websites for universities to be able to use and manipulate. We have um, wanted to create a discussion, a policy debate globally. And it's very rich data because it's 27 countries, so you can compare country with country. You can then compare region with region. Um, and that, that fuels a lot of uh, policy debate. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that you know, um, Don said we launched in London and then Sao Paulo, uh, but there have been major events uh, globally, including from San Francisco to Shanghai and, and uh, Beijing to Berlin. So uh, there is a, a, a big debate going on. There are policy implications of that, uh, and we want to keep that alive. So I think that's, that's why we did it. All right, good. Uh, I'm going to go back here because I want to come back to the gender gap. It interests me so much. Sylvina, uh, in your experience, uh, is this something to worry about? Have you seen this in, in, in the work that you've been doing, and, and how do we address it if it is a problem? Well, I'm not surprised. This is a, an evolution of what it was in the past. Uh, technology comes more natural for men than for women. That explains why only 3% of women are actually leading technology companies, despite the fact that those women that lead technology companies usually get a 35% more return on investment. 
technology doesn't come natural for women because when women want to start up, they usually think on things that are more considered cute, like for example, lemon-shaped soft factory. They don't think high technology, they don't think high innovation. And this is something that can be explained by the fact that it's very difficult for women to raise capital. VC firms are mainly led by men. Only 9% of companies that are into the VC business uh, involve, in a, uh, involve women in the decision making of who will get the money. Also, their perception of themselves, they usually try to uh, strike a better balance between personal life and entrepreneurship is really, really tough. It's a, a, day a daily life commitment. It's extremely difficult because you have to devote basically all your energies to, um, to that. So that can explain why, why it happened. And also education. I remember I went to public relations school and pretty much 95% of my colleagues were female. And in engineer, in science, in mathematics, usually the, the people that are part of the, the schools are, are men. That's helped the gender gap. But hopefully it will change uh, with time. I think the gap in terms of considering themselves cutting edge on technology is 11 point, is not big. What is big is the other difference between technology influencing, the, influencing their life. Because for women, dialogue, communication, soft attributes are much more important than hard data. So technology didn't shape the life to many women. In my case, it did. I work on the digital consulting. I met my husband in Match.com, and I also do a lot of shopping on the internet. But it's an exception. Usually, women are much more driven by soft, social, communication-related or craft factors. So let me, I want to ask the panel on this, uh, and again, technology doesn't have to be central to everyone's lives. It's, I don't think it's central to my life, although it's very important. But to the extent there are policy and consumer implications that come out of this, I'm asking the whole panel here, what can be done about it? Uh, are there things that can be done that would sort of change this balance? <sighs> Nando? That's, uh, that's tough. I mean, yeah, the, the sort of the stereotype of the Silicon Valley, uh, you know, tech guru is always a guy. You know, there's, uh, you know, policy-wise, I, I, I don't know. One of the one of the things that that sort of uh, that Sabina mentioned was the sort of work-life balance. I think this is this is a uh, a problem that um, permeates many industries, not just not just tech. But um, how do we create uh, work infrastructure or, or an economic infrastructure that allows for um, family care as well as sort of career advancement. I mean, I don't think we've figured that out yet as a society. Um, and I think that's true whether it's tech or whether it's, you know, selling shoes, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I think that from a policy standpoint, I think that's the, that's the, num that's the, the number one thing, sort of how do we uh, create a, a work culture or an, an economic culture that allows women to uh, balance their careers and uh, and and sort of their family goals. Well, it, sorry, I, you know I think one of the things from the survey was sort of the importance of education and and the impact it has on technology. And you know there, there's a stat that if you show an inclination for one of the STEM industries in the eighth grade, you are two to three times more likely to pursue a field or to pursue uh, a career in one of those mm -hmm. fields. Um, ultimately, when girls reach eighth grade they are a third, I mean, they, they represent a third of the people who actually express that inclination. So it's about getting to them earlier, getting to them in elementary school, middle school, adding that as part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, you know, there isn't enough role models for them after eighth grade. They consider it to be something nerdy, and you know, it's the, the, I guess for younger generations, or for younger people in general, um, the, the social life is more important for them. So ultimately, technology, kind of puts them, pigeonholes them as a nerd as opposed to the prom queen. Right. Richard? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think one of the, the really interesting points about doing the research is that yeah, y you might say that there are some surprising findings in the research, or you might say that actually a lot of the things the research throws up is, is quite intuitive, and we knew that anyway. The difference is, having done the research from a you know, credible organization, polling company, um, corporates can then look at the data. So to us, um, this is something that we are you know, absolutely taking action on. So we've now started a women in leadership program within Telefonica. 
Um, it is about role models, it's about culture, it's about the work-life balance, it's about all those things. But actually having the research then allows you to have the debate, that then allows you to have put in place all the things you've discussed to make it more attractive to, to, to uh, um, encourage uh, females you know, to, 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 to close that gender gap. And I think, you know, it, it, one company can do something, a hundred companies can have a far more but larger impact. The policy debate is interesting. You touched on education. I think role models, I think um, how people, the, the curriculum certainly in the, U, in the UK or in Europe probably isn't fit for purpose um, for teaching digital skills. Um, you know, it, 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 <laughs> we're, we're still operating in an educational system um, and it was interesting in the survey that, 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 that one, the most important thing that the millennials thought or, or wanted to, to, to talk about as important to their lives was access to quality of education. And then when they were asked what education, it was in technology. And I think we, we need to get that right at an early age uh, for girls in school. Uh, we need role models, we need corporates to change their policies. And then there's no quick fix, but I think it can be closed over time. So, uh, Danny, I want to come back to you. So, you're, you're an entrepreneur, and you run a lab that is helping to incubate entrepreneurs. So, one of the really interesting tensions that we talked about here that is in this survey is, on the one hand, great insecurity, economic insecurity, about what the future may hold for them. And, on the other hand, a certain sense of optimism um, and a spirit, a can-do spirit, that we can create something for the future, and I can make that happen. So, how do you... How do you balance, or how do you deal with that tension? Um, and do you see that in the people that you're dealing with, that they're, they're very uncertain about how they fit in economically uh, into the world, and at the same time, they think they can do anything? A absolutely, and I, I think entrepreneurship is sort of the key to both of those things. So there is this economic insecurity, so they feel uh, a greater inclination to create Sort of their what own. the hell, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's you know, they see entrepreneurship as a way to provide that economic stability for them. Um, and I think that's sort of generally for all millennials. And then I think amongst the millennial leaders, their big inclination towards entrepreneurship is they feel that business models are outdated, that not enough of them are based on social responsibility, social impact, sustainability. I think you saw in the survey, there was a lot of other things that were important to millennials. So the millennial leaders are using entrepreneurship as a means to disrupt whole business systems, not just specific industries. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, uh, entrepreneurship isn't necessarily um, a career path. I think it's a, it's a professional characteristic. Uh, you're looking at big companies now who are dealing with change constantly, mm. and they're developing intrapreneurs, people mm -hmm. who are willing to, or not willing, but able to do rapid prototyping, lean business models, try new things within a larger corporate structure. Um, so, you know, entrepreneurship now is a means to uh, create a career when there isn't a lot of opportunities, but ultimately it's preparing them better than they think to become part of larger corporations. So larger that's interesting it, it, that if it's a mindset that you can apply no matter what circumstance you're in and basically to challenge the conventional wisdom, even if you find yourself in a very large organization and yet you are concerned that if you rock the boat too much, that perch that you have there may actually be, be somewhat perilous. I, I'm just raising the question whether or not over time that will be a balance that they are having a hard time finding the right way to deal with. Yeah, and I mean, I, you know, I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis for an yeah, entrepreneur sure. and for the individual company, but ultimately I think, and you're starting to see this already with, with large companies doing you know, crowdsourced ideas, uh, idea generation, crowdfund campaigns, uh, even big brands are doing them, and I think you know, ultimately larger corporations just in general and generally amongst entrepreneurs, there's just a greater appreciation for new ideas and disruption, especially with the rate at which technology is changing and as a result, all industries. Right. So Nando, I want to come now and spend some time with our, all of us because uh, we're in the business here of how do we reach audiences, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we persuade and have an impact on audiences? So Fusion, uh, a great new channel, a cable channel that's been jointly launched by ABC News and uh, Univision uh, to appeal specifically, as you said, to, uh, in the United States, multiculturals, uh, younger multiculturals and millennials and Hispanics. Um, so you've taken this on and you've identified this as a, a group that you really want to go after. But what are the challenges? What are the issues with reaching and engaging uh, uh, this group of people in a way that's going to be meaningful? They're online all the time, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, the biggest challenge, I think, for any media organization is that 
social media and technology generally has transformed the way people even think about media, right? Um, before, it used to be you kind of sat down on the TV and it was more of a passive experience and sort of the newspaper was sort of a, a, a functional thing to sort of let, tell you what's going on, right? Um, you, so you used media to, in order to be entertained or to be informed, right? That was the purpose of why you consume media, right? These days, that's changed dramatically for young people. They consume media as a form of self-expression, right? Social media has basically taken, you know, the, the cliches <laughs> of back in the day of like, you know, the guy who had crazy hair in order to sort of, you know, express himself or whatever, um, uh, you know, uh, to the nth degree, right? Because everyone's public profile is online and visible to everyone. So they basically use that to express themselves, right? If we sort of accept that everyone is fundamentally lonely and insecure and searching for social and sexual validation, um, then we understand that when, as media creators, we have to tap into that sort of emotional need, right? Um, for example, um, we have to ask ourselves, what is this piece of content that I'm creating communicating to the person who I'm trying to reach as friends, right? So um, a GIF of, you know, uh, Patrick Stewart in Star, in Star Trek sort of going like this, you know, is a way to communicate extreme disappointment, for example. Just a moment, right? right? Just right. that little... That little, that little snippet. Yep. But understanding what, that, what that's communicating is the most important thing you can do. So, for example, something, if you look at things that go viral, uh, like, unexpectedly, right? The Coney video, you guys remember this thing? Um, it was like a 30-minute video about some dictator in Africa, right? You know, sort of the anti-viral thing, right? But what did that video communicate about the person who was sharing it? Like, ooh, you know, I care about the issues, bro. You know, um, sort of they, they tapped into something very, very clear, and they understood that very, very well. Um, so as, as media creators, we have to change the way we think about the way we do news or entertainment or whatever, uh, you know, where it's not just how funny is it, how entertaining is it, you know, how informative is it, or whatever. Um, it's what it's saying to the person who I'm trying to reach as friends. And I think that's just, that's a very fundamental shift and very, very hard and difficult to understand. Um, the other challenge of, uh, of social media is that, and it's the one that's more understood than, this, than the, my previous point, is sort of this notion that now we have to have a conversation, right? Um, that if you don't let the audience in, you just don't even have a chance. Um, so I think those are the two, the two fundamental things that, that, that we're looking at, is sort of what, what emotional touch, uh, you know, what emotional strings are we trying to pull? You know, we have to identify them deliberately um, and try to tickle them, if that makes sense. Um, that's like, you know, heresy for most news organizations in the past, right? It was just like, you know, whether it's news or, I don't but know. Our, one thing that comes through here, again, we've talked about this, their desire to make a difference. And, and they do want to be very purpose-driven in their lives and their careers. So is that more important, or is it very important for reaching them that there's a sense of purpose and mission that lies behind whatever media you're using to reach Yeah, it, per, you know, the mission is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, how, how clever something makes you seem is very important. You know, like if you found this cool thing, you know, that makes you seem a little smarter or a little bit more, you know, in tune with what's cool, um, that's, that's incredibly important. Um, you know, how funny something makes you seem, like if you look at your kids' Facebook timelines, you know, they're all trying to be funny, right? You know, humor is one of the big uh, currencies of self-expression of this generation, right? That's why Vine is my favorite social platform. Vine, that's, Vine is great. You know, <laughs> yeah. everyone, the people who are successful on Vine are the people who are funny on Vine, right? Yeah. Um, the boomer generation uh, used music as a form of self-expression, right? Like if you had like a Ramones t-shirt, like that like said something about you, you know? Um, and uh, So it's interesting, you think in some ways, I don't want to push you too far on this, that humor has re uh, come to replace or is starting to replace yeah, music. Yeah, totally. I mean, especially because our music culture has been so nicheified and, stra you know, it's hard to, um, you know, it's just, there, there aren't sort of like the big sort of unifying cultural forces anymore. Um, but humor is something that's universal. Um, and as, you know, communications executives, that's incredibly important. You see, like, the successful ad campaigns, it's like the funny ones, right? Um, um, or the inspiring ones. The, so those two sort of mission-driven or humor-based are the easiest way to sort of... 
happen. So uh, quickly, anyone else from the panel in terms of how you, how you reach these people as audiences? How do you, how do you touch them and, and, and get them engaged? Any, any thoughts on that from your experience? Well, I think that Nando covers it all, but memes is one of the examples of something that can, can become very viral and engagement because it conveys humor. So things that touch their hearts, things that make them laugh, things that make them stop and things are usually what are the most engaging in, in social media and the best ways to, to reach a young audience. Yeah, and things that say something about them, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's not just about how funny it is, right? Because, you know, if you look at the success of, of The Daily Show, for example, of Jon Stewart, right? He's not the funniest comedian in the world, right? He doesn't, th there's not, there's funnier guys out there, or there's funnier comedians out there. But what does he do? He, t he, he, he has become um, uh, sort of, if, you, if you're a fan of The Daily Show and you watch The Daily Show, it says something about you, right? It says something about you beyond, you know, it says I'm smart, you know, I care about, you know, important stuff. Um, but I can do it in like a, like a clever and witty way. But you don't care so much. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, Richard, uh, you, you touched on this before. Uh, this, you, you've spread the word around, about this around the world, and I think you've talked to a lot of uh, people in government and sort of leaders in different countries, uh, both in government and those that are in NGOs and the like. What kind of, uh, what's their reaction been and what's their interest level been? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'd start by saying uh, hugely positive from our point of view, the traction it's had. So um, I, I think very rich data, there's a lot of debate. Uh, of course, you're getting regions comparing themselves with regions. So in Western Europe, um, frankly, the levels of optimism, the concerns about the economy, the concerns about getting a job, um, the youth unemployment that we've got in Southern Europe, these are huge issues not just to that generation, but actually to the whole uh, future productivity, economic growth of the region. So there's a lot of political traction, and I'm delighted to say it, it, it's different depending on, on where you are. So we did an event in uh, Bogota um, a few weeks ago. Great to see the president tweeting about it. Um, a lot of optimism in Colombia. I think they have the largest percentage of the millennial elites that you, or leaders that you talked about. So huge levels of optimism um, uh, and the belief about changing the world. In Europe, you know, we have the digital agenda, so it's a different debate. But what's really good is we've had European commissioners actually chairing these sort of panel debates. Um, it's on the digital agenda. It was at the EU summit um, last month. Um, Action is already being taken. Um, they've, they've formed a leaders club of, of top entrepreneurs. Uh, and they're now looking at, you know, from an education point of view, what needs to happen, from a gender gap point of view, what needs to happen, from a how do you get entrepreneurs to stay in their country, so business incubators, accelerators, so you don't want people you know, all emigrating to, to Palo Alto or anywhere else to, to form their businesses. Um, so th that debate is live. Um, should there be policy issues that come out of it? Yes, there should. Do we need to continue the debate to get politicians to um, respond and react? Yes, we do. Can we rely on politicians to do it? No, we can't. Um, I think that's got to be a, a combination of the, the public and private sector. Uh, but actually, I think we have to empower the young people to have the voice. Great. So we have time now for questions from the audience. I hope there are some. And, and please ask questions about the research and other aspects of it that haven't been talked about here. Uh, but does anyone have anything they want to raise? Right out here. Hi, thanks, guys. A question for Nando, sort of picking up on your whole sort of socialization of news, if you will. And sure. um, you know, I think we're seeing this. I mean, even as in shows like GMA and the transformation that they've gone through and, and the success they've had. I think the evidence. We know them well. They're our partners. Completely there. Um, my question is, in you know, hard news, real hard news delivery things people really need to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that mean that we'll have to couch, you know, news, breaking news about us, I don't know, you know, take it to extremes, assassinations, um, horrific events, great events in, in a bigger context in order for that news to break through, in order to make it yeah, so shareable, you, if you will? So the, you, you, you asked a question about hard news, right? And that's the sort of fundamental question facing most journalism organizations today. And there's, there's a few types of hard news, right? There's the sort of breaking assassination news, sort of the Boston bombing is the example of one type of hard news. Um, and then there's another type of hard news, which is sort of like the, the stuff that's important that sort of affects stuff, if that, for lack of a better term. Um, so the Boston bombing as an example for hard news. 
I think that journalism organizations have to shift the way they um, gather the information in, in, in an event like that. Um, you know, uh, you, you, when you look at the economics of news, news gathering has become much, much easier, you know. But there's this, there's this feeling that unless we've gathered it, it doesn't really count, right? I mean, if you look at, I don't know if you guys remember this movie, uh, All the President's Men, the, the Bob Woodward and <laughs> Carl Bernstein movie. Yeah, right? It actually kind of holds up. Movie. But uh, uh, it actually kind of holds up. But there's a scene where they're like looking for one person's name and they're like going into the library and they have to come out with like these giant books and like, you know, the kind of thing that would take 0.05 seconds these days, like takes them, you know, three days. Um, so the news gathering has become much easier. The thing is, journalism organizations haven't, haven't sorted themselves out well enough yet to sort of piggyback on what other people are gathering, right? So um, if some, if, you know, for example, in the Boston <laughs> bombing, the local uh, NPR station at, in Boston, WBUR, was actually doing an excellent job of reporting in real time. Uh, you look at CNN and they were doing a garbage job of reporting in real time, right? They got everything wrong That's and they were... That's not nice. Yeah, <laughs> not, seen in, not seen in Espanol, the, the, the other one. Um, <laughs> this doesn't count. Uh, so. So, so for a breaking news situation or a hard news situation like that, what journalism organizations have become is curators of information rather than sort of gatherers of information. So that's the fundamental sort of shift in there. And then the other kind of news um, is really all about context, right? It's sort of, you know, when, pe when you have to paint a picture of the world for someone, you know, the, um, you know, the, the way you engage with someone is if you, uh, you know, facts alone, don't paint a picture. They're random data points uh, in, you know, sort of a, and it's impossible for a, the normal person to sort of sort them out into, it's just impossible, even very, very educated people. You have to paint a, a broader arc, you know, a broader narrative, and sort of fit the facts into that broader narrative and worldview, right? That's a little bit of, that's kind of a fundamental shift in what news, in America at least, had drifted away from. Um, so that's, that's interesting, kind of and it, it goes to this notion of reaching them emotionally mm -hmm. rather than factually. Yeah. Right? yeah. Other questions? Yes. Earlier on, you mentioned that the internet is actually closing the gap and people are under being able to understand each other. In 100 years, what will be the key languages in the world? <laughs> Uh, uh, Vedic chants, I don't know. Uh, I es guess... Esperanto. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I s language is the way we understand them. I mean, I guess... I mean, I suppose English will still, you know, be important. Uh, um, you know, I, I lived in China uh, for, for a while, uh, and it's interesting. If, uh, Chinese people pick a Western name like at, at a certain point in their lives, like when in their 20s or something, especially if they work in anything beyond sort of an immediate Chinese thing. <coughs> like, you know, Kevin Ross, and like they'll make it up. And they just, you know, like it's interesting that the, you know, when people speak of like the importance of learning Mandarin, and it's important um, because in order to do business in China, you, you, you have to know Mandarin very well. But like sort of in the global world, Chinese people are much more focused on learning English. So I suppose English. I mean, I think, like I think the language of technology as well. I mean, you know, it's, you might not be able to understand something from one language to the other, but now everyone recognizes the at handle, right, for a Twitter handle or a hashtag. Or, um, or, or an yeah. emoticon. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with Danny. I mean, one hopes it's English, um, otherwise I've got a problem. Um, <laughs> well, 100 years from now, it won't matter. 100 years from now, it won't matter. But I mean, I think on a serious note, the fourth literacy is absolutely the digital literacy. And it's my point about education. So we can teach reading, writing, arithmetic, if you like, but it's about, are we, if you do not understand coding, you will have a real problem. So I think the fourth literacy is digital, um, because it's not about a generation of web users, it's about a generation of web makers. <laughs> And if you do not understand the coding and how you operate in that, I think you're going to be hugely challenged. Yeah. Yeah. Others? No, oh, here's one. Good. So I 
So um, I'm still confused why millennial women would still feel like there's a you know some kind of a you know negative to be studying technology because they grew up in a in an era when Steve Jobs was a hot you know wow you know god so why would they feel that and a millennial men do not you know i i don't really understand you know the points you were making about that it doesn't make sense to me right so i mean i guess you know here in the us uh, things might be a little bit different cuz technology is sort of vastly penetrated uh, and omnipresent but if you look at some of the other um, you know, findings in, in, the, uh, in the survey, one of them in particular that I thought was interesting was being on the sort of cutting edge of technology. And maybe it's just a certain confidence thing. I, I don't know what the biology is behind it, but, you know, men were closer to 80% in terms of them feeling like they're on the cutting edge. That doesn't mean they are. It doesn't mean they aren't. They feel like they are. Uh, whereas women trailed in terms of that confidence level, confidence level of being at the cutting edge of technology. And it's sort of that confidence level in middle school during these adolescent years where they are losing interest in STEM. So my original point was simply to reach them early, reach them in elementary school and in middle school. And I think that's true, but I just, you know, I would think with my generation, I would totally think that this would be true, that women would maybe take, you know, that because we just were not brought up with technology. But it, it concerns me that there's still that discrepancy. Well, and, and I it makes... I think to your point, tech, it may though. be something that's going to write itself now, as I said, we should do our next survey on two to five year olds, right? And you know how they're <laughs> yeah. engaging in all of these but things. Because I think things are changing and the ubiquity and the embrace of technologies uh, and devices and everything else is it perhaps going to change all of that. I think, so. I, think, but it go, I think it goes beyond tech, right? I mean, I think it's, I mean, we're looking at just the tech stats, but um, you know, women graduate more than men in college and they graduate with better grades, but they don't, they don't do as well in, they don't, they don't earn as much and they don't have as much advancement in, in, in any industry. There's not a single industry, I mean, outside of like porn, uh, you know, so. Um, no, no, in porn they do, they out earn men. But, uh, um, we, we but, get, so, but so, so it's not just a tech thing, it's like so, a broader. I'm getting the hook now from Paul, but I'm not sure whether it's because of the last response. Say porn and it's over. Anyway. I. Th Thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks to this great panel. And uh, we will make it possible for you to know where to find all this information online. Uh, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity here, Paul. Thanks. <laughs>